All right. So over the next 40 minutes, we're going to be discussing CTEF. And as Larry so eloquently described, it's the chronic thromboembolism pulmonary hypertension, which is obvious, um, often very underdiagnosed. Um, and the paradigm of treatment of uh, CTEF has really changed over the last decade. So it's, it's a very important diagnosis that is often missed. So we're going to go through the imaging modalities, uh, how to optimize imaging protocols and diagnosis, uh, treatment, and then go through a case review at the end to describe some examples. So pulmonary hypertension, I'm sure all of you know this is the WHO uh, classification, and this has been updated many times over the last decade. And so CTEF is really WHO group four, uh, which encompasses chronic thromboembolism pulmonary hypertension. Um, so we're going to be focusing on that for the rest of the lecture. Um, but it's important to keep in mind all of the other classifications of pulmonary hypertension um, and the need to exclude all of those in a, in a full workup for, for pulmonary hypertension. So quick question, true or false, 80% of patients with CTEF have a known uh, thromboembolism event preceding the diagnosis. How many people think that's true? Raise your hand. False? Yes, excellent. So every year in the US, we have a half a million people diagnosed with acute pulmonary embolism. And it's often silent. As much as half of these patients with CTEF actually had no um, previous diagnosis of pulmonary embolism or venous thromboembolism event, even including DVT. Um, and so the true incidence is really unknown, but we suspect that somewhere between 1% and 5% of acute PE survivors go on to develop CTEF. Now, we know that a lot of patients have um, a, an inducible event that causes their venous thromboembolism or their VV, DVT, for instance, um, a trauma, and they have fractures or um, an orthopedic surgery or a long flight. But there's certainly a, a huge number of um, these patients who have really no inducible event. So if we look at kind of this paradigm, we've got all these big, uh, large number of patients with uh, PE. Only a percentage of them actually have some reported symptom or reduction in their functional status. And um, then a smaller percentage of that go on to have persistent thrombi um, in, the, in the pulmonary system. And then as we are getting even smaller, we've got a, a number of them who have a measurable limitation in cardiopulmonary function. And then CTEF is really this small number of patients here um, who grow on to develop pulmonary hypertension from their venous thromboembolism. And post-thrombotic uh, syndrome is, is a real uh, diagnosis here. And that is um, involving a larger number of patients who may go on to develop CTEF. And so when we look at the proportion of patients who will, who will go on to develop CTEF, the literature is really all over the place. So that's why we don't really know what percentage. If you look at all of these studies uh, together, it's somewhere between 0.1 to 10%. So we're not so good at, at diagnosing it. Uh, so we're going to have a little fun here at the end of the day. Uh, hopefully get a little participation, do some cases for the last little bit, and... Uh, I guess you can be the judge of whether they're fascinating or not, but so, uh, and, and people can call things out if they want, or you can actually, you know, if you have a, uh, in your, if you have a pencil or pen, you could just write things down before I give it away. So um, here's case one, and so this patient has this, and the patient has this, and I guess we have a choice here. So this is a, a, a good way to start out. And as I say, some of these are, well, any of these could be in the middle of the night. Who knows? But, uh, you know, is this asbestosis? Is it sarcoidosis? You can write your cho chosen number down. Is it tuberculosis or is it lymphoma? I guess there's a couple of possibilities here. What do you, anybody have any thoughts? TB, okay. Sarcoidosis. Okay, yeah, I, I think I think it's probably not the. That they're both. Their asbestosis is really the one that is not in the differential. I think the only thing that might help you is there's a lot of symmetry here, so that favors a sarcoidosis. But I I certainly wouldn't argue. And you can have what's called miliary sarcoidosis, which is often peribronchovascular. Um, so just to talk about sarcoidosis, because otherwise. We're not going to talk about it. So basically, sarcoidosis in some ways is like um, silicosis. It looks like silicosis. It, the difference is we have an occupational exposure with 
silicosis, and we don't know what the exposure is, but it, it's an airborne exposure. Um, it's often, you know, uh, the African American population, women. Uh, one of the classic things people say is that the symptoms are usually minor, even if the x ray looks or the CT looks pretty bad. I mentioned the symmetry tends to, to be a little, you know, a little bit more telling. Um, and we talked about the pattern. Really on CT, there's the random pattern, which I showed you for miliary. There's the central lobular pattern, which I showed you for endobronchial kinds of things. And then there's this peribronchovascular pattern, which is, has a, a central lobular component, but also is along the airways. And sarcoid tends to, to be that. The other thing, by the way, is that the thing that kills them is not the lung disease, but it's actually the cardiac disease. And here's a patient who has uh, some lesions in the heart. So they get syncope and, and sudden death. So, um, okay, here's another case. And this rolls into the ER a lot of times. It looks like some kind of chronic lung process, right? Um, and, uh, you know, it looks like it's, uh, there's some cystic change. It's peripheral, basal or predominant. Um, so we have the alphabet soup, and I didn't give a whole lecture on alphabet soup, uh, which is very confusing, but this is kind of a classic. Does anybody have any thoughts on this one? I'll tell you about the others no matter what, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah, this is a classic look for UIP, okay? So basically, um, we talked about a COP, and we might talk about that again. Uh, DIP uh, tends to be very air spacey and not to have a lot of, honeycombing is gonna be at the edge of the lungs, um, and NSIP doesn't usually have honeycombing. So honeycombing, when you see honeycombing and it's basilar, it's usually IPF, UIP, which is... I'd like to go into my second talk, and this is, again, part of our building blocks of the performance of cardiac MRI examinations. And I titled this Practical Cardiac MRI Using Viability Imaging as a Workhorse. So let's get going. So as an overview and outline, I wanted to talk about briefly what about myocardial viability is and how we can apply it in our examinations, what the LGE technique is and why it works, some of the pros and cons of those various sequences, and how we use it in both ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Well, this is a LGE sequence uh, that we use to evaluate myocardial viability. And this has been around for 20 plus years and it was originally called the SCAR sequence. And I can tell you that I, we were at, at the Cleveland Clinic, the second site uh, in the country that had this sequence. The, the sequence was developed at Northwestern in Chicago by doctors uh, Ray Kim, Bob Judd, and Lon Simonetti. And when we were initially using this, it was felt to be for scar tissue in the heart. And so we called it the scar technique. And then it gradually became the delayed enhancement technique. And some people would call it the delayed hyper enhancement technique. But for consistency uh, across the field of cardiac MRI, uh, the sequence is now been called the late or is called the late gadolinium enhancement technique, LGE. And I want to say this technique is really pretty incredible because, you know, the people in the back of the room uh, can tell you what's going on here and that this is typically sort of a black and white phenomena and that we see the, the black myocardium on the undersurface or inferior wall of the left ventricle and that's good viable myocardium and all this pure white stuff here in the anterior wall and apex is transmural scar tissue, uh, non-viable dead tissue. There, it's a binary uh, aspect right at the at beginning of using this technique. Now it's advanced a bit since then. We'll get into some of those details, but I want to start with ischemic disease and really looking at what we call viability. So let's ask that question. Uh, what is myocardial viability? And from the clinical perspective, a simple, straightforward way, uh, we are looking at dysfunctional myocardium, meaning it doesn't function normally, that has the potential for functional recovery or improvement following revascularization. But 
technically and by definition, viability is differentiating myocardium that is alive versus dead. And that is precisely and distinctly what this technique it gets at and is different from some of the other comparator techniques that are commonly used. So how we do, how do we presently go about determining viability? What has been considered the gold standard is positron emission tomography with both perfusion uh, and metabolism imaging here with an example of ammonia and FDG imaging. And other approaches have been with SPECT imaging using 24-hour uh, rest redistribution thallium uh, or other approaches using SPECT with technetium uh, or low-dose dobutamine stress studies. And that can be done most typically with echocardiography, but here's an example uh, of a patient who's getting a low-dose dobutamine stress cardiac MRI. So these are all ways to go about it.